Next, author Christopher Hitchens delivers a lecture titled Crucibles Past and Present. He and author Salman Rushdie, chair of the Penn World Voices Festival, have a conversation following the lecture. Cooper Union in New York City hosts the hour and 20 minute event. Right, hello everybody. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Salman Rushdie. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're here for the closing event of what I think has been a pretty good festival, the sixth one. And the Arthur Miller Lecture is always something we care a lot about. And as, as you'll know, we have a, a bit of bad news and a bit of good news. The sad news is that Chairman Alexei couldn't make it. And you know, we're very sad. I mean, there are personal reasons, and we don't want to go into it. But basically, there's a good reason why he's not here. And fortunately for us, the good news is that we were able, at very, very short notice, to get Christopher Richens to come and do the lecture instead. And <laughs> and he is over there. <laughs> um, and uh, Christopher is going to talk. Um, well, his title is obviously quite relevant to Arthur Miller: Crucibles, Past and Present. Um, and the way we're going to do it is that he's going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes. Then I'm going to come up here and we're going to talk for about another 25, 30 minutes. And then, uh, you know, we'd love to throw it open to you and have you join in as well and ask questions of Christopher and like that. So without any further ado, Christopher Hitchens, author of God is Not Great and a thousand other books. Um, here he is. Well, thank you, Salman, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming, and thank you to Penn for honoring me twice, once by giving me the Abraham Lincoln podium, which, if anything, would encourage one to abuse. I can't think of a more solid temptation than that. And the other is to be asked to speak in the name of, um, of Arthur Miller and on the, the tropes with which those of us in the writing business will always identify him. Um, I don't consider myself supremely qualified to talk, certainly not in his name, but I can say that I knew him a little, that my wife and I were married by the same rabbi, the late Robert Goldberg, who married Arthur Miller to Marilyn Monroe, the same rabbi, in fact, who also was his character witness at the same time at the House on american Activities Committee, because it wasn't enough that Arthur was trying to get married to the woman considered the most beautiful in the world. He was at the time having to ask questions about whether or not he counted as an American at all. And I, I can't not tell you just a couple of things about him and, um, and Marilyn. Um, I just can't, so I will. Um, I can't not, so I will. Um, when she was first introduced to the Miller family, Robert Goldberg, by the way, to the end of his life, resisted all efforts to buy from him her conversion certificate to Judaism, a subject to which she was fairly new when she met the Miller family. And Mr. and Mrs. Miller Sr. used to feed her, thinking she needed a bit of you know, fattening up. And um, it often would begin with matzo ball soup. In fact, it would invariably begin that way, until the evening when she asked if they ever ate any other part of the matzo. Um, contrary to the slightly hoydenish reputation that Ms. Monroe has had ever since, has clung to her ever since, she was actually rather demure and rather modest, shy girl. And the bathroom in the Miller house was a bit too near the living room. So out of shyness, I suppose you could say, pudeur, as the French would put it, she used to, um, when she retired there, uh, turn on all the taps very loudly, um, just out of discretion, you know. Uh, you wanted not depress the in-laws. And um, after she'd gone, and, Mar and Arthur turned to his mother and said, well, what did you think? His mother's opinion was very important to him. As Mrs. Miller Sr. said, well, she's a very nice girl, but she sure pisses like a racehorse. <laughs> well, OK, I, I had to do that, um, but it's not strictly to the purpose. Um, somebody told me this evening that it was possible that attendance was down 
uh, at today's events because of a, an attempted uh, atrocity in um, Times Square last night. And if that was true, <clears throat> I would both be depressed and um, I would take it as an opportunity to underline what I wanted to talk about in the case of Mr. Miller and in the topic I picked, which was Crucible's present and past, um, which is to say the contagion of fear. Um, as the United States found out in the 1950s, it's, it's, it's incredibly easy, it's depressingly easy, shall one say, to get people who are the children of a revolution, <clears throat> who are born into a country that is governed by a constitution, uh, with all the, all the rights and privileges of a free society. It's very, very easy to get people to give that up, or to devalue it, or to panic and abandon the values of that constitution, in particular of its amendments, its wonderful amendments that constitute the Bill of Rights. And the reason why Arthur Miller was so important to us, and remains important, I think, to people who don't remember any of it, is that he was one of the very few Americans who would say, no, I'm, I'm not going to go along with this, and made out of it a famous play recalling an earlier time before the founding of the Republic, before the proclamation and promulgation of the Constitution, when there was an era of witch hunting, which is another way of saying clerical or religious panic, uh, persecution, uh, tyranny, and hysteria, and to see under what conditions we who look down on the poor old primitive uneducated settlers of the Bay Colony, uh, on what conditions we're entitled to do that? What gives us the right to condescend to people if we aren't sure in our own minds that we would be able in the same conditions to resist? I think it's a fair bet that anyone who, who takes the trouble to buy a ticket to a pen event has played this game in their head at some point in their life. How would I shape up? <clears throat> what would I do? when the neighbors were being shipped onto the trains, or maybe when, because that so often comes when it's too late, you think maybe I should have done something before they started putting them on the trains. When should I have started? Would it have been with the censorship? Would it have been with the racism? Would it have been with the off the record imprisonments and executions? At what point, I, I feel sure I would have taken a stand at some point. I, I would have been brave. We all, we all have had to do this and we've all had to look at societies contemporary to ours and in the past, and asked, well, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> what when the Fugitive Slave Act is still on the books and has been extended to the states of the North as well? What about it when the slave catchers cross over into Pennsylvania and come as far as New York, uh, and there's a bounty out, and there's a lot of pressure to obey the law? Of course I'm going to shelter this wanted guy in my house, aren't I? Everyone thinks that they would. Everyone has a, it's a pleasurable imagination until you begin to doubt yourself, until you begin to think, I wonder if I would be that good. There's a wonderful poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay. It's called Conscientious Objector. I can't quote it all, but it begins, it's just come back to me, but it begins, um, I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. Uh, I owe him nothing. He's mounting up in the yard today. His horse, his hooves are clattering. He has business in Cuba, but I will not give him a leg up. I will not tell him where the black boy lies in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. Well, this is a hard test for people to pass. And by the time I'd got to know Arthur Miller, um, he was, of course, quite old, but he'd, he'd continued to witness throughout his life for many decades. I remember when I was at The Nation magazine publishing an extraordinary article, or helping to publish, a, a very humorous account he gave of going to a dinner at the American Embassy in Turkey at the head of a Penn delegation, which included himself and Harold Pinter and how Harold Pinter had given the American ambassador to Turkey an absolutely ruinous time uh, throughout the dinner, all night, because of Turkey's treatment of, the, of its Kurdish minority. And I had my differences with Harold Pinter. And in fact, I'd had my differences with that same American ambassador. And I could almost feel sorry for Ambassador Strauss Hupe at having to face Miller and Pinter for an evening, knowing that American policy was complicit in a, a near genocidal policy in southeastern Anatolia. And you know, you could have let that go. You could have said, we're here on a delegation of writers. It's nice of the ambassador to have a dinner. We can sit this one out. No, you can't. No, this is your chance. You'll always be sorry later if you kept quiet. There's never a good occasion for keeping your mouth shut. So, so far nothing but praise for Arthur from me. But there came a time when a good friend of mine and a great friend of the cause of writing and of free expression and of writers and people who 
willing to sacrifice free expression, Salman Rushdie, was hit, as you all remember, by the clerical dictator of the theocratic dictator of a foreign state with a, a fatwa, that's the way the word entered our language, that condemned him, Salman, to both a life sentence and a death sentence. It condemned him to death and it enjoined all Muslims in the world to bring it about, which meant that Salman had to alter his social life and other arrangements quite radically for, for a bit. And, well, I remember thinking on that day, which was the 14th of February, 1989, well, for me, for my lot, for us, this is the case. This is the test. We often wondered what would it be in our generation. Most free speech cases you'll find if you look into them, from the, from the trial of Socrates onwards, have been to do with blasphemy. Socrates, Galileo, Spinoza, you can fill in blanks for yourself. Almost always that someone is accused to have gone too far this time and to have outraged the sensibilities of the community as well as the laws and codes of the state and the city and profaned the gods, um, uh, which you really can't have because then where would we be? How would we know how to behave if it wasn't for a celestial dictatorship? We wouldn't know right from wrong without that. So it's a really subversive thing to be doing. I thought, well, that's pretty easy. Um, but we should do better, perhaps, than just get the usual suspects to sign the usual free speech petition. Uh, maybe we should all say, since the fatwa applies, explicitly applies to all those responsible for publication of the book, uh, a missing codicil that's often not mentioned, we should all sign a petition saying we consider ourselves co-responsible on the model of Spartacus or the, the Danish volunteers in the, the Nazi occupation who said if the Jews are made to wear a yellow star, we'll wear one too, and they can't get us all. So, I thought it was a good idea, um, just to up the ante a bit. And then Susan Sontag, who, to whom I also would like to dedicate any value to you that these remarks may possess, and to her memory, who was that year's president of Penn, fortunately, um, it came uh, the horrible news that a lot of people were strangely reluctant to sign. That the fear factor, the feeling that the Ayatollah Khomeini's arm could reach that far, that death squads were on the prowl, that anyone who got too closely identified with this might themselves become the object of a hit, was actually keeping away some people from the meeting we planned to have to read from someone's book and keeping their names off the list. And they said, no, I don't want to sign. And I, I tell this story in my upcoming memoir. I don't, I don't want to say anything at all to undermine the memory of Arthur, but there was a crisis with him. And he, he said, you know what, you probably don't need me. Um, after all, I'm Jewish. It would only attract attention. It would change the subject. Um, it's amazing how persuasive fear can be. You can always think of a good reason. I'll behave better next time. Um, maybe this isn't such a crux after all. And I remember thinking, this really is for me a moral and intellectual uh, and personal uh, crisis because if the author of The Crucible has decided that he, this is an appointment he's reluctant to keep, uh, then we're all in very grave trouble. But of course, the, the story has a happy ending and Arthur came through uh, very well, as did a number of other people who'd hesitated. But I'll, I'll never forget that week and, how, and what I learned about how fragile, how tenuous uh, the commitment of the society to its basic values often is, and how easy it is to panic people into betraying them. And I'll stay with this trope, if you don't mind, because I think it's back, and I think the rot is spreading. And I think it began this present phase about exactly five years ago, when a small newspaper in the Jutland area of Denmark, called Yilans Posten, published some, you'll know about this, some cartoons, better to say caricatures, actually, of the figure of the Prophet Muhammad, who it's wrongly thought cannot ever be represented in art. There are several Islamic representations of him, particularly in Persian culture, oddly enough. Um, it's, not a, it's not a prohibition that is of any great value or of any great force. Though it's, it's believed to be by people who like to find cultural reasons, as they often do, for political cowardice and moral cowardice. At any rate, you know the sequel. There was an organized attempt to destroy the Danish economy by boycott coordinated by some very extreme mullahs in Denmark with some partners of theirs in other countries. Uh, there was an open season on uh, Danish people, many of whom were attacked in other countries uh, 
by the end of it, we think at least 300 people were killed, in, not all of them Danish, in different countries. There were riots between Muslims and Christians in Nigeria, in countries which, where no, demonstrations are never normally allowed at all and where the police control everything, such as Syria. Large crowds were allowed to burn down the Danish embassy um, without any apparent police intervention. And the thing had the, every appearance of a, a horrible orchestration. I thought, well, here again, what could be a clearer case? Here is a small Scandinavian democracy, which had a fairly heroic record of resistance to Nazism. Um, its citizens are peaceful. Um, its government is not allowed by law to censor the press. The demand was that the government close that paper and, and apologize for its publication. The Danish Prime Minister said, I can't do that. I have no right in law to affect the publication of, of cartoons or articles in Denmark. Um, but at least the Friends of Denmark will show their faces now, and we'll have a proper discussion about this full frontal challenge to the values of the First Amendment. Can't wait to see, for example, what the State Department will say. The Bush State Department, here's a chance for it to really stick out its chest and testify for real values. Well, the Bush State Department made a statement saying, we're very sorry about any offense caused by the Danish cartoons. Now, we don't keep a State Department going to comment on the internal affairs of Danish journalism. The State Department could reasonably have said that wasn't its job. Its job is to say we stand by our democratic allies and we particularly feel appalled at the violation of its diplomatic immunity and the sovereign protection of its diplomat. Couldn't even go that far. The first thing was to apologize. Well, that's bad, but I, I'm not a diplomat. I, I live in Washington, but I'm not a politician. I'm a journalist. I thought, well, the, the, my profession, my great profession will stick up on this point, we'll have a proper discussion. And the first thing is to show the cartoons because people must see what the fuss is about. I mean, if we don't live now in the age of the image, where do we live? Everything is image driven, newspapers, magazines, and of course the television. Everything is to do with the, the pictures themselves, the ipsissima. Not one outlet in the United States would publish or show those cartoons. Not one network, not one national newspaper, not one news magazine. I couldn't even get them on, uh, in my column in Slate, which is online, though you could in the end go by link to find them, but the magazine itself wouldn't take responsibility to do it. A small magazine I work for, Skeptical, um, it's called the Skeptical Inquirer, um, secular magazine. Um, it's actually, it's actually, it's not called the Skeptical Inquirer, it's called Free Inquiry. Pardon me, there are two I work for. Free Inquiry pub did publish them, um, I don't know if our circulation is even in five figures, but the bookstore chains immediately pulled all copies of our magazine from the shelves. And this was in response to no threat. It was in response to no pressure. It was in response to no danger at all. It's what, when I was a kid, we would say was crying before you were hurt. But I thought then, and I think now, it was a terrible capitulation. There wasn't anyone in the United States who would say, look, First order of business, let's see what the fuss is about. What do these pictures really look like? No one would take that responsibility. And nobody said it was for any other reason than fear. I know these people. I know these editors. I work for some of them. Why didn't you do it? What were you afraid of? We were afraid of reprisal. Well, of what value is your First Amendment? What, of what value is the enormous money that you make out of free expression? The, the giant revenues that are be, to, to be made in a country that enjoys the right of free publication if it won't be defended at the very first challenge. You think it can't get worse? Yes, it can. Uh, Yale University Press, uh, which is run by someone who used to be a publisher of mine but won't ever be again, called John Donacic, decides to commission a book by a Danish scholar on the Danish cartoons, a learned subject, um, sorry, a learned treatment of the subject, including the vexed question of, is there permissible representation of the Prophet Muhammad in Islamic art? Nicely produced book comes out, Yale University Press, the University of Nathan Hale, the man who said, give me liberty or give me death. And then at the last minute, they decide to cut out all the illustrations in the book, all of them, not just the cartoons, no illustration of any kind. Yale University Press, without a shot being fired, says, no, we're not going to do it. We don't have the guts for it. They even issued a statement saying that they felt if they did do so, they would be instigating violence. Now, another thing that depressed me at that point, separate, separate question, is it's a pity that at the university press of a great university, the proofreaders don't know the meaning of the word instigate. To instigate something is to try and make it happen. It's, to make, it's, it's, it's equivalent to saying incitement. It's saying you are 
you're trying to stir something up. It is your aim that there be violence if you instigate it. Um, in, the, in, in the passive use of the word, they made themselves responsible for any action taken of a criminal nature, criminally violent nature, by the publication of the book, which, was, which has two bad effects. One, it runs away and it deprives the readers, as well as the author of the book, of the right to discuss the matter freely. And second, in advance it excuses the criminal activity because, after all, it can't be their fault. It's ours for showing the pictures. It's ours for printing the book. It's ours for having Salman as an author in our midst. It's our fault. And so there's an indemnity given in advance to the men of violence. Uh, that's therefore a double insult, if you like, to the principles of civilization. And it goes on. Um, you'll probably remember on New Year's Eve, we were preoccupied at that point by the so-called Christmas bomber who nearly brought down a full civilian aircraft from Amsterdam <laughs> over the city of Detroit. But a few nights later, on New Year's Eve, uh, one of the authors of one of those cartoons, a man called Kurt Westergaard, a 79-year-old man, who was having a sleepover with his granddaughter in Copenhagen, one of the quietest, calmest, sweetest towns you can ever hope to see, has his door broken in with an ax by a wanted Somali gangster who's come to kill him and his granddaughter with an ax on New Year's Eve. And if he hadn't managed to lock himself in the bathroom and press a panic button, uh, they'd both be dead. And Mr. Westergaard, you'll be interested to hear, has since been let go by his magazine as someone who it's too much trouble to keep on the staff. It's, it's just, uh, it just happened a couple of weeks ago. He's, it's, um, it's all very well to stick up for free speech, but you know, there are limits. And you can't have someone embarrassing you by having his granddaughter and himself attacked on New Year's Eve. You know, it gets around, you look bad. You think it couldn't happen here? Well, I've already told you it could and has with the cartoon case. And then, <clears throat> I hope it won't have escaped your attention that last week, the, the channel on American television that above all prides itself on saying that the answer to the question, is nothing sacred, is always no. Where there's no, there is no cow that cannot be smacked around and, and uh, abused. Uh, Comedy Central decided that uh, discretion was by far the better part of value of valor, and of all things to, get, to cave in on, and of all the examples we could set to the smart and wised up American youth who like to watch it, South Park is told you can't make a teddy bear joke involving the Prophet Muhammad. And, and so irreverence central, no holds barred central, gives in without a fight, or should, let's say not without a fight, let's give them some credit. There is one nutcase who has one website in New York who posted a picture on his website of what happened to Theo van Gogh, the Dutch filmmaker, who made a film about the oppression of Muslim women in the city of Amsterdam, and who was ritually murdered in the street, having been shot off his bicycle, he was gutted like a sheep in the roadway and a knife plunged into his heart which held attached to it a letter, an open letter, to another good friend of mine, Miss Ayan Hershey Ali, whose wonderful new book Nomad is about to be published, telling her as an elected member of the Dutch parliament and a refugee from Somalia and from genital mutilation and from forced marriage and from sectarian warfare and religious theocratic oppression that she was next. And she now lives in this country and I can't even tell you where anymore because she too, like so many of my friends now in Europe and in the United States, has to go around with a permanent bodyguard. Whereas the people who put Theo van Gogh's picture on their website and say to the makers of Comedy Central, this is gonna to happen to you, sign revolutionmuslim.com, don't appear to feel any kind of fear at all. They seem to feel, as perhaps they are, that the First Amendment protects them too. Well, if it does, and if this great architecture of free speech, if this, this constitutional roof under which we've all been thriving so proudly for so long is to mean anything, then we're going to have to say revolution.com cannot close down an American cable channel at whim by making a little bit of a threat. So the question comes right back to where I suppose I initiated it, which is it's no longer a hypothetical one. You're not being asked what would you do when the climate of fear began to spread and when even people you thought to be reliable and brave will remember urgent appointments elsewhere 
and say, well, perhaps this particular meeting I could skip, <clears throat> or maybe that petition isn't so vitally important. After all, I've signed so many petitions in my time, I can miss one. And Anyway, Captain Alfred Dreyfus always looked a bit of a seedy character uh, to me, um, rather suspicious looking type. You know, maybe we should pick our fights with more care. You can feel the air, the atmosphere thickening with excuses and with euphemisms. No, the question is, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about it? Now, if, if what I was just told is true, the ranks of this very hall this evening were thinned, not by the prospect of having myself instead of Sherman Alexei, forbidding enough as it is, <laughs> but by a fizzle, by a fizzled nothing of a bomb in, um, in Times Square. Look, look, you are the children of a revolution. The United States did have to go through a great deal to erect this architecture of constitutional freedom and protection. People in living memory died to register to vote, um, to be able to uh, hold a public meeting, uh, to be able to assert their most basic and elementary rights. And we celebrate them every year. And we all wish we could have been there, and we weren't. But we can be, because uh, there'll always be a time, a rendezvous, with this question, and everyone's going to measure themselves, as Arthur Miller did, by how they shape up to it. So I can now, if I haven't made my point by now, I'm not going to have made it, am I? <laughs> and I think I've probably about trespassed on the point where Simon and I were going to talk, and then it, we'll, you can be our prisoners for a bit longer, and then we'll be your hostage. And so this would be the moment, perhaps, to invite back on the stage someone who has witnessed for this. <laughs> I wanted to just, I'm just going to want to, in some random way, respond to a few of the things you said, mm. and then we can, um, let's talk about the cartoons a bit more, because it seems to me that there's two separate issues about things like the Danish cartoons which get conflated. One is the question about, should the cartoons have been published in the first place? Now, it seems to me, any newspaper editor, anybody on a picture desk of a newspaper or a magazine, every day is presented with material where they have to make the decision, is this worth putting in the magazine or not? And I think we can also agree that maybe no two picture editors would make the same decisions. Some of them would print all those things, some of them would print one or two, some of them would print none of them. So on the one hand, you've got the argument about quality, and so on, should the things be in the paper? Yes. My, I mean, myself, I think, that most of them were rather tedious, and the ones that weren't were actually the most offensive ones. I mean, the best cartoon was the one which shows suicide bombers arriving at the pearly gates yes. to be greeted by the Prophet Muhammad saying, would you please stop doing it because we're running out of virgins? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, that, ha that, has the, I mean, that has the great merit of being funny. That has, yeah, has a bit of bite to yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, the one with the turban, the bomb in the turban, was similarly, you know, a, a, a perfectly legitimate, strong, satirical point. And well drawn, too. And well drawn. You know, and so those two, the ones that people got most exercised about, would actually be the ones that I would, if I was a picture editor, that I would have published, and many of the others were just beyond bland. <sighs> So that's one issue. Would you do it, would you not do it? But it seems to me then there's the, the second issue, is what, which is what you were talking about, I think, is what happens when the subject of violence arises. And at that point, it seems to me the subject changes. The subject is no longer about whether you should publish or not publish these things, but about how do you respond to violence? Yes. Do you respond to it with cowardice or courage? And at that point, it seems to me that every newspaper in the world should publish the Danish cartoons not because they like them and not actually because they particularly want to insult Islam, but just to make the point that you don't give in to threats. Yes. You know? And so I think sometimes, you know, when people start talking about the cartoons as objects, they, uh, you know, were they good or bad, were they offensive or inoffensive, it's, that's one half of the point. But the second half of the point is the question of the response to violence. You know? and, and I think that's, that's one of the things that has got very blurred recently. Well, should I, should I comment yeah. on um, Well, first, do you know what happens to Muhammad Atta when he blows himself up and arrives at the pearly gates? You don't know? Well, he was told, okay, welcome. Um, 
Let's see, who don't you know? Uh, here's Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Here's Mr. James Madison. Shakes his hand. Uh, have you met Mr. George Mason? Shakes his hand. Mr. Patrick Henry. Said, okay, Patrick Henry, what is this? He said, well, you did ask for 72 Virginians. <laughs> uh, there's actually, there's even a better thing. <laughs> I was afraid this might happen. <laughs> See, this is, I'm now not kidding, serious Islamic scholarship has recently suggested that the 72 virgins was a mistranslation of the original and then what was actually supposed to greet um, people on their arrival as martyrs was 72 raisins. Yeah. <laughs> raisins or white grapes. You know, it's white a, there's grapes, a very yeah. good, there's a Syrio-Aramaic mistranslation of the Quran that uh, so appears to have done reasons, a lot of damage. I think one of the few good reasons for believing in the afterlife yes. is wanting to see the faces of <laughs> 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 Of, you know, Muhammad Atta and company arriving in heaven to be handed a bowl of raisins. Yeah. <laughs> it also adds to the strong case for saying that holy books are in fact man-made and not dictated by God, which is, I think, a good part of this discussion. Look, remember, the origin of the Danish question was this. It was proposed in Denmark, which was doing its level best, as many societies have, to make Muslims feel welcome in Danish society. It was thought the world's school children should learn about Islam. We should have a book for kids, a cartoon book, you know, all you need to know, Islam for beginners kind of thing. But they couldn't get any cartoonists, children's cartoonists, to do it because they were afraid of making a mistake, yes. of upsetting someone. So it was to satirize this reticence and this fear that Fleming Rose, my friend, the editor of Gilan's Post, and said, all right, let's have a cartoonist competition and we'll see if we can represent the prophet. Mm. So it, it begins with this reticence. The second thing is, you're right, of course, that people should do it out of solidarity. And you're right, of course, that it's a judgment call in point of taste in the first instance. But once it's become a matter of violence and controversy, there's a second stage where you have to report it. Yes, you do. Which everybody did on the front page, except they reported it without the content. Yeah. Let's do it without the picture. I, I can't really think of a, of a parallel of what, I mean, they would say, well, Picasso's gone too far with Guernica. Mm. Um, you know, he's taken an obviously propagandistic attitude towards the Spanish Civil War. Uh, there's a huge row about this painting. Um, you'd be very interested to know more about it, but unfortunately we can't show you what it looks like, because that would be yeah. uh, inviting reprisal from Franco or something. I can't think of a, I can't think of a, of a, but even worse now was everything is image. Everything is imagery. And one of the most I think mealy-mouthed pieces of language that has developed to justify this kind of behavior is a kind of reinvention of the meaning of the word respect. Mm -hmm. now, it, it seemed to me when I was growing up that respect meant that you took people seriously. <laughs> it didn't mean that you never disagreed with them. Um, you know, to, to respect someone is to say, okay, we'll take on what you have to say and if I don't agree with it, I will offer a counter-argument. The idea that it would be disrespectful to someone to in any way disagree from their system of belief is a new idea, is a new meaning of yes. the term respect. And it seems to me to have nothing to do with respect. And what it actually means is I'm too afraid to do it. So what you have is cowardice masquerading as, dis as respect. And that's become more and more and more common, <coughs> very clear in the case of the, of, the, of the cartoons. Because I think the point you made, which needs to be said a great deal, is that, is that blasphemy, the, the, the refusal to accept the church as the limiting point on thought, is something which throughout human history has been the thing that has moved the human race forward. I mean, you mentioned Galileo um, and uh, Socrates. And one should also remind people that the trial of Jesus Christ was a blasphemy trial. Sure was. Um, you know, so, and, and from those three, you could say you have you know, Western religious belief, Western scientific understanding, and Western philosophy. They all emerge from blasphemy cases. Yeah, he was asking for trouble by saying he was the son of God. Yes, yes. Yes. He knew what he was doing, as they used to say meaningfully about you. I, re I remember that. I always was amused, or not amused, it wasn't funny at the time, 
Um, when people said that about me that I knew what I was doing, it would be really strange, I thought, mm. to spend five years writing a novel and not know what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what would that be, that act? But then uh, uh, another thought, though, which I meant to intrude earlier, you were raised a Muslim. Yeah, well, so you can be accused of apostasy. I know, except my parents were about as Muslim as a chewed off fingernail. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've, al I've always thought that the great gift my parents gave me was to not be religious. They sort of excused me religion. No, well, I, I, that's true, but in the eyes of the... Um, I know, yes. Apostasy. Of the Umar, you, mm. you belong, like just as that's why people yes. say lapsed Catholic. You can't yeah. leave the church unless you're excommunicated. No, no, if I'd been called you, you, you Harvey can't. Weinstein, there would yeah. have been no fatwa. No. Well, there wouldn't have been... I mean, maybe there should have been. That's another question. Yes, actually, that's a very tempting... <laughs> no, never mind, that's not good. Um, I mean, but with, 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 you, with you and Ayan Hershey Ali and with Chazlim and Nazreen and many others, there's the question of apostasy, which Muslims yes. can, if they like, claim as their internal affair. What's interesting now with Denmark is a new line, and Comedy Central, mm. and a couple of other events in London, is that the line's being crossed. Now, you don't have to be a Muslim to be brought within the range no. of uh, reprisal. I remember quite soon after the attack on the Stunning Verses being sent by a fan a T-shirt on which was the legend, Blasphemy is a Victimless Crime. <laughs> <laughs> which you have to think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you realize that it's completely in, in line with, with your, uh, with, with God is not great, because of course it's God who is the victim who doesn't exist. Um, yes, yeah, Salman want... rather woundingly said of my title that it was annoyingly one word too long. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, circumcise one word and you've got the truth. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, ask you a couple of things not I mean I think yes this is we should come back to this a bit but it seemed to me one of the things that to people of our generation it's very strange I think is the recrudescence of religion as a political force um, because when we were kids in the 60s there were many things that were up there that we needed to fight against it, I don't think it ever occurred to us mm -hmm that the power of religion, whatever religion, would once again be the thing we had to battle. I mean, we actually thought that that battle was won. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that we were wrong. And I wanted to ask you why you think that is. What is it? You know, uh, one of the things that Andre Malraux yeah. is supposed to have said and apparently did not say is that the 21st century will be the century of religion. Apparently he didn't say that. Um, but it seems so far, on the basis of 10 years, uh, uh, to be the case. And I wonder why you think it is that this battle that we all thought was over has returned to become the central battle of our time. Well, Lenin apparently really did say that he thought the last battle would be between communism and Islam. Mm -hmm. Partly because Islam was a competitor in the third world against imperialism, mm -hmm. uh, which in some ways it, it can still represent itself as being. So I think that a approximate cause, not an exact one, but an approximate cause would be a contributing cause, probably is the collapse of communism. Mm. Um, not least in the Soviet Union itself, or rather in former Soviet territory itself, where now, for example, the Russian Orthodox Church, the old patron of um, serfdom and czarism and anti-Semitism, is now fully back in a very dangerous nationalist form. It's the clerical bodyguard to Putin's regime. It has special privileges within the state. Uh, the army and elsewhere, and, and over all other faiths in Russia. That's a very, by the way, I think it'll be a very dangerous thing as Russian chauvinism and revanchism gets more increased. We have a tremendous revival of the forces of reaction in the Roman Catholic Church, exemplified by this very squalid Bavarian bureaucrat who's the current pope, who's, you know, whose first act uh, as pope was to readmit to the church those who'd been excommunicated for denying the Holocaust and so on, mm. to, to rebuild the, the, the hard right wing element of Catholicism that basically thought Vatican II was a mistake. Mm. So re-fundamentalizing what they still think of as the one true church. Then you have the crazy settlers in, in occupied uh, territories in Palestine who think that they can bring on the Messiah by stealing Arab land. And then you have the Christians who say, wouldn't that be a great idea? Mm -hmm. uh, we support the Jews as the rope supports the hanging man. You know, they bring on the apocalypse, we get Jesus back. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of whom are in this country and trying still to maintain. And this goes on too, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, that American children should be taught garbage with equal time. No. Um, now girls and boys, after the chemistry practice, will have alchemy break. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I remember, it's enough to make a cat laugh, isn't it? But they, ne they never stop in, in Texas and, and also big book, school book producing areas that this nonsense is, is unstoppable. Now, I remember at the time that, that the state of Kansas uh, decided that um, intelligent design had to be taught at the same level as, as the, the, that straight, vaguely unproved theory called Darwinism. Um, it, it actually, I wrote a piece in which, it's, it, which I suggested that this decision by the state of Kansas showed that Darwin was wrong. Because it, <laughs> because it showed that natural selection did not always choose the fittest yes, to survive. And, yeah. and <laughs> sometimes the unfittest survived. And that it was actually possible for the human race to regress as well as progress. So there was a wonderful, in Alabama, I remember, there was a, a public servant who said, that we couldn't be sure about the truth of the theory about the Big Bang because nobody was there at the time. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, they, but the, the equal time demand, I've, I think, is, is a, an excellent one because there are now a very large number of churches who take this view, who are in support, um, sorry, in receipt of grants from the so-called faith-based initiative, which I'm sorry to say President Obama hasn't canceled, or otherwise in receipt of a tax break. And so it seems to me very clear we should take them up on equal time, say, so we'll teach your stuff in the schools at, at least once a week, in the, not in the science class, but in the social studies bit, and you have to sell and teach uh, Darwin material 50% uh, of the time in your church. But, you know, just to press you... And that'll be the law, and see how they like a little of that. Seems to me, even if you just look at the United States, if you look at the politics of the post-war period, if you look at the, the Eisenhower election, even, even the Kennedy election, so, that it wasn't so necessary for religion to be a subject in the election. Nowadays, it seems to me you can't be elected dog catcher in America unless you talk about your deep belief in such and such church. Why do you think it is that there's so much greater power <coughs> of, of religious discourse in this country? I actually think that that's only true if you and everyone else keeps saying so. Mm. I mean, the, the number of people who, who check none of the above for religion in the country has doubled in the last year. Mm. Or I've sold in the last year, the last five years, to something like 16, 17%. I think it's probably higher. Um, the number of people who check the box and say, I am a Baptist or I am a Catholic, uh, I know because I go and debate in their churches full of crisis and uncertainty. It doesn't reflect a, a monolithic religiosity at all. Um, Barack Obama got elected while having to disown the only church he'd ever been near. Mm. He'd taken so little care to pick one uh, that it nearly got him unelected, the church he went to. Mm. Since hasn't been to a church at all and ended his inauguration speech, which I attended, with a very good quotation from Thomas Paine. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure at all. I think if a person of reasonable integrity and honesty and, and presentability, let's say, was able to face the election and say, I personally don't attend a church and don't have a belief. I think there's every reason to think they could win. Well, I hope you're right. The political right in this country clearly thinks that the religious card is well worth playing. Yes, but the Christian right have had a very thin time lately. Um, and the Catholic right as well. Um, I mean, who, who really now thinks that the Catholic Church has any moral right to tell a politician that they'll be denied the sacraments if they don't conform? I mean, I'd like to see them try it again. I really do. would like to see that. Well, to, that would once have been a very dreadful threat. To move it outside this country, one of the, let me just ask you, given the, you know, the Huntington <laughs> thesis, all these ideas yes. about clash of civilizations, um, what do you think? Do you think these are wars of religion? Or are they wars, as many wars of religion have done, uh, wars which use religion as a cloak for other discontents? Well, I'm sure it's both, but a lot of the latter. I mean, remember that the Crusades, which the Muslim world goes on about a lot, and quite understandably, began with a huge pogrom against European Jewry. Mm -hmm. Then when they more or less finished that, nearly finished it, they moved across the Bosphorus, or not across, but to the Bosphorus, and destroyed Byzantine Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which they thought of as a, as a heresy and an anathema. So before they even got to Jerusalem and started butchering the Muslims, they'd, they'd settled accounts with the Jews and with <clears throat> the only other papacy, the only other Christian rival, <coughs> excuse me, in the picture. So I think Sir Stephen Runciman is probably quite right to say that, that, that at that point, 
the Crusades were the most retarding experience that human civilization had ever undergone, and we're still, we're still suffering from the consequences. It was an intra-Christian war that led to the Crusades. Likewise, as you can see in Iraq and elsewhere, there's, a, there's at least one civil war within Islam, between the Sunni and the Shia, mm -hmm. uh, against Ahmadi Muslims, for example, who are considered heretical, especially in Pakistan, um, against the Sufism. Um, it's becoming a warlord religion almost, Islam, because there are dueling fatwas issued by separate authorities. Unluckily for them in some ways and for us, they don't have a pope mm -hmm. who can put a unified line everyone has to follow. There are various centers of power. And uh, often they want to settle these disputes on non-Muslim soil. Yeah. I mean, after all, no Sunni government ever supported the fatwa against you, I think. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, it was no, no government at all, actually, other than, other than that of, uh, of Iran. Of Iran. And, and that was partly for political reasons, because actually when the protests against the satanic verses began, they were largely financed by Saudi Arabia. Um, and the Iranian fatwa actually hijacked yes. a Saudi uh, campaign thus enormously pissing off Saudi Arabia. And it's one of the reasons... No one outbids the Ayatollah. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I just would like to point out in regard to me and the Ayatollah Khomeini that, you know, one of us is dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, do not mess with novelists. <laughs> yes. Uh, Literar litera scripta manet, the, the written word will remain. Um, and it's true that if you look at the, the Muslim world, the political, apart from the Sunni-Shia split, the political dissensions are so profound that it's very difficult to speak of a jihad. Yes. Uh, you know, you, I mean, the, the Afghans hate the Iranians who hate the Saudis who hate the Syrians, and you know, so on. So the, the, it's, it's clearly not unified. But on the other hand, mm -hmm there clearly has grown up something which is of appeal to, it may be a small group, but a, but a dangerous group, uh, where the idea of the, the, the pan-global <laughs> jihad has become very attractive. Yes. And what do you think that's about? I mean, it's very noticeable, for example, the, the I shouldn't prejudge their case, but I, I don't like the look of it, the four Pakistani boys who left a suburb of my hometown the other day and turned up in the wrong camp in Pakistan are, uh, only the latest in a large number of, of young men from England, from France, elsewhere, who've volunteered to go die in remote parts of the Muslim world. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? It always has to be they want to go work with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't a young Muslim in, in London, before 2001, have wanted to go and fight with the Northern Alliance mm -hmm. in Afghanistan? Uh, which was a, as, as Muslim an organization as could be, had fought against the Soviet Union, was opposed to the Taliban, um, had probably had more support than it did. No one goes to volunteer for that. Um, no one went to volunteer for the Kurdish people who were fighting against Saddam Hussein, just as Muslim. Um, all, the, all the Muslim activists took the side of Saddam Hussein when it came to the crunch in the war, mm -hmm. uh, who, was, who himself enjoyed the support of Al Qaeda. Um, if not in a military operational sense, you had the sympathy of their proclamations. In some horrible way, it's thought that you're an Uncle Tom if you're any other kind of Muslim. Yes. The, the authentic stuff <coughs> has to be the most horrible, the most extreme, and the most completely consecrated to violence, the, that consecration being sealed by self-destruction, suicide. So that it really is a battle for what you could call the soul of mm. um, Islam. I sometimes think, I wondered what you think about this, that in the way that Soviet communism, Soviet-style communism, kind of burned through a large part of the world and then burned out, um, there's an argument which says that in those countries where radical Islam has become most powerful, it is also most disliked. That's to say, you know, that mm. the people of Afghanistan, a very large majority of them, do not like the Taliban very large majority of the population of Iran does not like the rule of the Ayatollahs. Sure. The people of Algeria who flirted with the feasts of the GIA very rapidly moved away from them. So it, so Iraq? Hmm? Iraq has totally like isolated Iraq. the Al-Qaeda. So, so here's an argument which is that here is a, here's a rhetoric which appears to be very attractive 
um, kind of sexy, glamorous, uh, particularly to young men, particularly to young men without much hope of a future. And it can burn into a society with great speed, but then very rapidly people come to decide to discover that they hate it. Yes. So, so what do you think of that idea that this may be a short-lived phenomenon? By the way, I think you're obviously right. I mean, there's every sign of a, of a turn of that kind among the people of Somalia now, mm -hmm. as well against the so-called Shabab, many of whom are foreign volunteers, quite a lot of them Americans. Um, and yes, no one who's ever tried it once wants to try it again. Mm. Uh, that's absolutely true. But it's a lot to go through. Um, and it can very, I mean, this, uh, Afghanistan will, will take a long, long time to recover. Yes. Just from a fairly brief period of, of um, Taliban rule, it's not very difficult to diagnose. I mean, after all, if you forbid yourself the talents of 50% of the population to start with, just before you do anything else, then you ban music, then you ban all books that aren't the Quran, um, the, 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 the floor is going to keep on dropping. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to bring it back up to where it was. So, yeah. If you mean, might we just let them burn themselves out? I'm no, I don't think you were saying anything no, as callous that. as that, but no. if you think, well, could we sit it out in some... I mean, I, I sometimes think perhaps not, because the damage done is so great. And the problem with it, as with all theocracies, is it doesn't have a self-critical capacity. Mm -hmm. If they look around and they notice, okay, all the children's teeth are falling out. Um, nothing works here except the secret police. In the fields, nothing really grows except footprints. Mm -hmm. Um, what have we been doing wrong? What they'll say is, we haven't been doing anything wrong. We just maybe haven't been praying hard enough. And in the meantime, the crusader Zionist conspiracy has been at work to subvert our country. Yeah. So of the huge number of failed and unemployed and unemployable young men they've got, they try to export them. They export the violence back to the West. So that we have every interest in not just stopping the jihadist element, but in stopping the terrible underdevelopment that Islamism brings. I mean, just to say it this way, very often you read people, quite smart people, saying, well, these people are the product of poverty and unemployment. Say, so, you've heard it. No, they're not. They're the cause of poverty and unemployment. No society they've ever had any control over has not been immediately more poor and with much less employment. The national income of Indonesia was reduced by a whole point by the attacks of uh, Al-Qaeda on Bali, for example. They drove many people into poverty and unemployment. That's their plan. Don't fool yourself that it's a protest against uh, uh, bad conditions. It's a wish for them. At the height of the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, non-Soviet socialist voices uh, in Europe and America, around the world, made a distinction between what they saw as the distortions of the Soviet yes. system and what they called actually existing, what they called actually existing communism, um, which was clearly cruel and despotic and you know, so on and so on, and if you like, true socialism. Yes. The, the true church of Karl Marx, which was virtuous. It, see, it, it, it seems to me now that there's often a similar argument being made. Uh, people who wish to distinct, distinguish themselves from you know, actually existing Islam, which is cruel and despotic in many of its national manifestations, and the separate idea of the true faith, which is you know, religion of peace and love. And, and I wondered what you thought about that. Well, I was one of those on the left who spent a lot of time with the, with the left opposition in Eastern Europe, people who did take a form of that critique, I mean, oh. who, 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 were, who were not in favor of NATO or capitalism. People like, I suppose in Poland, Adam Miknik would have been one. Mm -hmm. Not Havel, but some of the Czech opposition were, were democratic socialists of one kind or another. Yeah, and in Yugoslavia too, and in Bosnia mm -hmm. particularly. So, and I still have some sympathy for that, that critique. The thing about that is it's, it's a bit more testable objectively. I mean, if you come to the conclusion, actually there is something wrong with the pricing policy of a socialist economy. It has, of all things, real difficulty working out what the value of things ought to be. And this probably isn't um, a result of it being hijacked. It, it may be a fault mm. ab initio. There's, you don't think you're going to go to hell for saying that, <laughs> say. Yeah. Or you don't, know, you don't bring upon yourself quite the same condemnation. Mm -hmm. The thing about um, theocracy is that it, it tends to say, 
that um, if, if anything goes wrong, if the system breaks down, it, it is only because we haven't tried it hard enough. Yeah. Thus, for example, I, I go on about this all the time. We should be thinking about our Iranian brothers and sisters every day, not just the struggle they're having to bring about a democracy and the fact that the Revolutionary Guards who've taken over their country are also the people who control the nuclear weapons, but that on top of that, Iran is booked to have a terrible seismic catastrophe. It's coming like a heart attack to Tehran. And no, no one's doing anything to earthquake, earthquake proof the country at all, nothing. Nothing like what the Chileans have done even. It's more like Haiti. And at Friday prayers, I, I knew this would happen. Friday prayers, a couple, I've been writing about it for weeks. At Friday prayers the week before last, the guy did discuss the possibility mm -hmm. of, of the earthquake coming, being quite bad news, which by the way it will be if there are underground nuclear facilities that no one knows about. And he said, well, of course there'll be an earthquake because women insist on uncovering their faces. Yes, the promiscuity of women. This was the official sermon of Friday in yes. Tehran. The sexuality of women yes. was the cause of the earthquake. Yes. Now, both of, us, both of us have suffered from it's the seismic. Fault. <laughs> both of us have suffered from the seismic effects of the female sex. Speak for yourself. And we know it can't be, <laughs> we know it can't be underestimated. It's a, it can move mountains all right. But, <laughs> This is ridiculous, <laughs> but they know they have to have an explanation. And um, well, I, do, I don't think even Stalinoid Marxism ever quite no no crapped it's out a, to it's that a new low. degree. Yeah. It's a new look. That's right. Look, before I want to open it up to the audience, but just before we do, I want to ask you one question on a different subject, mm. which is something like the subject that that Sherman Alexei might have been addressing, which is to do with the future of of journalism. Uh, in, this, in the new age we find ourselves in. Clearly, you've spent most of your life as a working journalist, and we live in a moment when the environment is being transformed. Yes. I, I, I had dinner about a year ago um, in, in Washington, and I was seated next to the publisher of the Washington Post, Catherine Weymouth, and I asked her, because there were many stories about the Washington Post being in, in, in difficulties, mm. And, and I asked her, uh, how bad was it? And, and she said, you know, it's very bad. And she said to me that she had recently been in Silicon Valley and had gone to visit various of the leading figures, Yahoo, Google, etc. And, and she had said to them, uh, she, said, she asked them, if, if you were me, what would you do? And they had all re responded, shut down the newspaper and concentrate on the website. <laughs> Uh, which was something which shocked her and which clearly she didn't want to do. Uh, but it was an indication of a, of, of a revolution coming. Now, the worry, of course, for many of us is that the Internet has not yet shown itself to be capable of supporting a news-gathering investigative uh, project of the kind that great newspapers have supported. Yes. So if the print media die and the Internet fails immediately to replace them, what are the prospects, if you like, for the truth? Yes, well, one reason why I nearly couldn't make your kind invitation this evening was that last night we had to give uh, uh, the party at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, the annual thing where the press fawns too much on the president and the president fawns slightly too much on the press, and there we all were in the Washington Hilton ballroom, and I thought, you know, it, it looks thinner every year somehow. Um, and I could add to what, I, and Catherine was there. She came to our office, and I, I was thinking, the Washington Times, which is the only rival to the Washington Post in Washington now, and which is a paper owned by the Reverend Sung Myung Moon of the Unification Church, at that, is very nearly dead. And we'll be a one newspaper town pretty cool. soon. I think last year, um, Seattle became a one newspaper town. I was astounded by that, I have to say. St. Louis, I think. Three or four. Los Angeles has been one for a bit, and the LA Times has gone down faster and further than anyone would have believed. Um, well, everyone knows a bit of this story, I suppose, but the, it's the speed of it that impresses me. And that's at the production end, if you like. At the demand end, I teach writing, and I I've, I've sometimes teach journalism. And of my students, I would say that none now regularly take a newspaper. Hmm. And that's, that's more or less it. Uh, the demographic, as we say, that's, that's a death sentence. If, if the habit of picking up a paper and carrying it around with you or taking it into the house in the morning 
is gone among the young, then you've more or less set the clock. But what are the consequences of that? Well, they're, 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 so I used to think, well, the positive thing is that now, if I have a bright young student whose work is promising, I don't, I can't just, I don't have to limit myself to saying to them, look, I could probably introduce you to someone in the newsroom in Chicago or New York, wherever it might be, uh, probably get your, your clips read, you might be able to bypass having to join the newspaper guild or a union or anything like this, that so you might get a break. I, I can say to them, look, you could, you could put up your own site, you could publish. If you're doomed to write, you're doomed to write. And you could say, okay, okay I'll, I'll put it up there and see if anyone wants to come. Expose yourself directly to the thing. And that's been quite encouraging. And I know some people who've done rather well out of it. But here's what I think is the danger. It's a, partly the one you identify. It opens us to a, a, an era of so terrible relativism where everyone's opinion is as good as anyone else's. You don't have to earn, a, earn any credibility in a way. Um, and pretty soon you'd have not just your own opinions but your own choice of facts. And there wouldn't be a common stock of reference. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, by the way, also a problem in teaching literature these days. Very difficult to find a book that everyone has read. But do you, think, um, do you think that the things like the iPad and the Kindle are ways for newspapers to survive? Yes, I, I mean, I think they're the only way they can survive. But it's, it won't postpone, it won't postpone, I don't think people who weren't buying the New York Times weren't buying it because they couldn't get it on Kindle, or will, or will now read it because they can get it that way. And there's actually an easy proof of that, I think. I was in, um, I hate taxi TV, don't you? Yes. Um, but one particularly abject thing that happened to me the other day in New York was it was a New York Times ad clearly pitched to the youth market in that fawning way that older marketers talk to young people or the people they imagine to be young and say, just get the weekend edition. You don't have to sweat through all the news and yeah. uh, news and just, it's, it's all about sports and games and music and theater yeah. and, so, and the movies. You love it. Yeah. And the Washington Times, excuse me, the Washington Catherine's advertising in, on the radio in Washington is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Just take it for a couple of days a week and read the fun stuff. Yeah. Don't think of us as a fuddy-duddy news gathering. We're not going to bore you with lots of stories about oh, yeah. you know, Afghanistan or crap yeah. like that. Downers. Everything is entertainment. Yeah. So the defeat has already been experienced, yeah. if you like. Right. It's a shame. I was telling someone before, but has anyone seen the paper with Michael Keaton? Phil. Great. And Marisa Tomei? Great. Great. A great movie, I think about a day in the life of a hack tabloid journalist in New York. He's obviously working for the Post. But the three papers are on his table in the morning, and his paper headline says, you know, headless body and topless bar, and the Daily News says something like, you know, Ford to New York drop dead, and um, the New York Times says, uh, signs of swing to moderation in Nepalese elections. <laughs> And he throws the paper to the floor and says, these bastards would do anything to sell newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's over, believe me. Well, on that point, let's, we have about 15 minutes or so. So if people have questions they'd like to ask Christopher, there's two microphones there and there. And if you could... Or you, sir. Um, well, or me, but really him. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you could go to the microphones and, and take it in turn. Yeah, that's good. I love free speech, but I'm worried about Fox News. Their influence, they have so many viewers and they lie so much. Is Jon Stewart enough, you know, and Colbert? How do we deal with them? It's, 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 it, they just make all the noise in the world. Yeah, I sometimes feel that I'm not as judgmental about Fox as I might be, but it's because I was brought up in, for a lot, large part of the early part of my life in, in London where there's no pretense of objectivity in journalism. <laughs> where you, 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 know, you know what you're getting. You, you look at the newsstands and they're ablaze with different papers that are party-oriented, that are run by the, in the interests of certain proprietors, not least among them Keith Rupert Murdoch, um, who I last saw at 3 o'clock this morning by the French Embassy swimming pool <laughs> with a wife She's half his age. <laughs> <Yeah. his edges. laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> looking, by the way, looking by the way, as if he's got a lot of good years left in him. Um, so I don't get shocked so easily. What, what I don't like is, is, a, is a paper or an outlet that pretends to be objective and is not. I think that's much more of a danger. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I'd like to ask uh, both of you what you think about, there's a, 
there's been a relatively recent court case about the Pledge of Allegiance in which uh, uh, the plaintiff was, was arguing that it's, it's a semi-prayer, you know, especially the part where it says under God, and trying to discourage and trying to make it you know, illegal to, uh, to force kids or, or encourage kids to, to say that during school. I wondered what you thought about that. Well, I know, the, I know the case very well, and I think Mr. Newdow, who brought it, is actually a slight pain in the ass, because instead of saying what he should have said, which is that the Pledge of Allegiance was written and promulgated and became popular and well-loved right across America in the 1880s, written by a socialist who was trying to bring America society back together after the Civil War, and was trying to think of a pledge that anyone in the country could recite whatever their background. It went on like that. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible, with justice, liberty and justice for all. It's beautiful. In the McCarthy years, the time of the toad, as uh, Arthur Miller and Leon, Lillian Hellman used to call it, it was objected by some big mouth at a flag day ceremony at a cleric, where, where Eisenhower was president and, and was also present, said this pledge could be recited by a child in Moscow word for word. So how could you make it so it couldn't be? New problem. How could we have a pledge that couldn't be recited in Moscow? Shove in two words where they don't belong, destroy the rhythm of the thing, and, and make it um, religious, put in under God. So what you want to say is, no, I'm for original intent. I'm a strict constructionist. <laughs> I want the pledge back the way it was. Most people are under the impression that it always had those words in, and the atheists are coming to take it out. This is stupid. But of course, it's flat out unconstitutional to ask a child to say under God. You may not do that. First Amendment is beautifully written. There's no wiggle room in it. Congress may make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Thank you. Uh, Great Britain is having an election this week. And one of the candidates who seems to be doing very well, Nick Clegg of the uh, Liberal Democrats, is a professed atheist. If he does very well in that election, does that mean something changing in Britain, something new that we don't have in this country? No, England is very different to the United States in this regard. When Tony Blair, who, was, who is deeply religious, uh, was running for office, he, his, his main kind of flat catcher, Alistair Campbell, uh, said, openly afterwards that they deliberately played down his religious beliefs because it would lose them votes. Now, in England, to be religious is to be a flake. <laughs> <laughs> and, and who would vote for you if, you if that's what you... You know, like I remember when George W. Bush was asked early in his presidency um, if he ever consulted his father um, now that he was president, and he said, pointing upwards, no, because he had another father mm. to whom he would refer. Now, if he were to say that in a British general election, he would be run out of town on a rail. <laughs> yes. I've always thought that actually what George Jr. was saying is I'd rather talk to any father than that one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Mr. young Mr. Clegg, as I think of him, um, used to be my intern at The Nation magazine. And um, of course, I would have hired him if he was a Muslim, but. Um, I'm glad to know that he still isn't a believer in any uh, holy book. And what someone says is true. In fact, I could have answered the last gentleman's question by saying this. Maybe we should just force all Americans to have uh, prayer in the schools, because I don't know a quicker way of bringing about the mass production of atheism among the young. <laughs> and that's certainly the reason for the secularization of British society is that religion is compulsory in English and Scottish and Welsh schools. It has to be a certain Christian Protestant kind. And the Queen is the head of the church as well as the state and the armed forces, which means that on the moment her heart ceases to beat, it should never happen. But the moment that does happen, Prince Charles becomes <laughs> the head of the Church of England, a battier Muslim fancier with no taste in women. <laughs> And that's what you get for founding a church on the family values of Henry VIII. <laughs> but I think no, the truth is, I think that in England it's just not an issue that Nick Clegg is not religious. No, would, no one would dream of bringing it up against him, no, and they would rebound on them if they did. Uh, no. uh, 
We'll see how well he actually does on the day. I mean, I have, I don't know what you think, Christopher. I think you could, you could argue that in the end, people will swing back towards the traditional two parties, or that the, the anti-labor sort of landslide has now gone so far that they're actually going to do even worse than the opinion poll suggested, that, and that actually we will have a two-party state, but the Labour Party will be the third party. I think it's a three-party society encased uncomfortably within a two-party duopoly, and every now and then it, 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 it comes out again. It did with Jeremy Thorpe, if you remember, mm. at one point in the 70s, and I think a, a large part of the vote for Mr. Clegg is a, is a call for proportional representation, which yeah. now has to be discussed seriously. Well, we'll find out on Thursday. Yes. Yes. Um, I was really sad to hear you say that when the Danes were trying to get a Muslim book for children, they didn't go to Muslims and ask, how do we do it? And that may have prevented the cartoons from happening, the cartoon um, contest. And the other thing mm. is all the talk about religion, it's really... The, the extremists, the fanatics, it's not the mainstream. Anyone, I believe, that's causing any difficulties anywhere, and I'd like your opinion. Well, the question, I mean, you, what you say sounds persuasive, and I don't know, by the way, that they didn't go to consult. They must, they would have done, uh, Muslim authorities, but the question would be, well, which ones would those be? Because there are quite a number of imams in Denmark, but the ones who started the row about the cartoons are very extreme, and they're, well, I'll come to your other, that use of that word in a second, um, and weren't going to, I think, allow any discussion of the subject that they did not themselves control. So if you went to one Muslim authority, you'd be, all you'd be doing was inviting yourself into a schismatic row with, between different factions of Muslims, which would be in a very depressing way to introduce Danish school children to the subject. That's the first thing. The second thing is the word fundamentalist or extreme has the following difficulty for me. Either <clears throat> there is a word of God or there is not. In my opinion, there is not. But if someone says, no, you, <clears throat> you know what, I think God did speak at Sinai or did speak at the baptism of uh, the Jordan or did intervene uh, to dictate texts of the Prophet Muhammad, why does that make you a fundamentalist? I mean, I think it's an extraordinary thing to believe. But if you say, no, I don't really believe that, what you are is not, not a fundamentalist. You're not religious. Fundamentalism says there is God's word, there is revelation, there has been revelation. Atheism is to say there hasn't. Belief is what? To split that difference, it can't be split. Yeah, I think we might even be able to discover a slight difference between Christopher and me here. Um, I mean, here's, Bring here's, it on. Here's a, I mean, Maybe it's more apparent than real, but I think my view is that if people are religious and gain from it satisfaction, nourishment, solace, whatever it is, um, my view is that's none of my business. When that comes into the public arena and, they, and people of religious belief try and force the values of that belief onto me or onto the society in which I live, then it's my business. Um, and I, I, and I, I have very strong views about whether or not <coughs> religion should be allowed into that arena. But in the privacy of one's own home or one's own mind, if one gains comfort from a certain set of ideas, however cockeyed they might be, that, I, my view is that's not your business or mine. I, I, I couldn't agree more, but it's, it's not in the nature of especially monotheism to let that happen because uh, they, they're looking at you going to hell. They, they're not allowed to do that. They, they're, they're, con, they're supposed to redeem you. Mm. They're supposed to save you. Yes, I'm not going to uh, be. Really they can't leave you alone. <clears throat> it's my, I will keep saying to them, if, if I thought there was a personal God who took all the trouble to care about me and supervise my movements and, and uh, have a tender attitude towards me in general, um, and even promised me that I would not croak. I guess, I have no idea what it would be like to feel anything so fatuous, but I, I suppose it would, make, it, would, it would make me happy. You know, why doesn't it make, it doesn't make them happy at all. The people who say they believe this, they can't be happy till I believe it too. Mm. And that's the cause of the constant uh, cultural battle. So no, I don't want to, I, why do I even know what they believe? So a church which was not militant, you think is not? <clears throat> not really, no, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be the church. Oh, well, Judaism doesn't proselytize, except among Jews. Much, mm -hmm. doesn't, <laughs> anymore. 
Um, yeah. Well, it also, it also it doesn't say the Messiah has already come. It has its, it has its advantages there, too. All right. Yes. Hi. Yeah, my question is about engagement and maybe the role for engagement. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about free speech and advocating it and standing up for it. But um, I live and work in China, and often when artists or musicians, writers abroad protest China, it does make it harder for people working in the system. So. I just want to see your thoughts on the balance between engagement and protest, I guess. Well, you keep hearing, I suppose it must sometimes be true that if everyone kept quiet about a certain country or a certain state and didn't get, give its government the impression that foreigners were intervening and so on, that, that it might make life easier for the local, the tamer sort of dissident. I mean, one, one is often told that. We're always told, for example, that Iranians don't welcome support for their efforts from outsiders because they, they can then be identified or even criminalized with the crime. But that's all right, again, as long as the regime itself stays out of my life. But the Iranians won't do that. They won't let me think, oh, well, I don't care what happens in Iran. On the contrary, they say they want to export people to kill Salman, uh, people to overthrow the democracy of Lebanon, people to blow up the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires. We know the names of the people who've been doing this in Tehran, and to have an off-the-record nuclear program. Well, I'm sorry, I'm, this is not their internal affair. And I don't have a single human rights question since you mentioned your domicile. Burma, the, uh, Zimbabwe, um, Iran, um, well, just those three for now. You try and do, get anything done about those appalling, at North Korea, these appalling, really appalling regimes, and you find that they're protected by a Chinese guarantee at the United Nations and in Sudan, Darfur to Sudan. China wants to buy all their oil, it's gonna, it, in the meantime, gives them all their, all their weapons. You cannot address major human rights drama in the world now without coming, against, coming up against Chinese power on the, on the wrong side. I'm sorry, this is not their internal affair. I'd also add to that, you know, uh, if you look at the experience of, of Penn, of Penn American Center, um, I'd say two things. Every time that Penn has supported a writer uh, in difficulties or arrested, whatever, in whatever country, um, we have heard back from those writers that it was enormously valuable to them to know that their case was being seen by the rest of the world and that they gained great strength and nourishment from the fact that their case was being highlighted. So certainly in the cases of those writers who have been on the front line, <coughs> to them it has mattered a great deal that their case was, uh, uh, was, was given prominence. You know, but there's another thing, which is if you look at the these so-called awards that Penn gives every year to writers, which are actually, obviously those are writers in jail, so the award is a way of highlighting their plight. There is an enormously high percentage, which I think is somewhere around 90%, of those writers being released from jail within a six-month period. And, and, and it is because That's very encouraging. tyranny does not like publicity. You know, it, it is one of the curious weaknesses of tyrants that they want to be liked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and if you could show them that they are not liked and actually that the world thinks they're assholes because of what they're doing to that writer or those writers, it's sometimes easier for them to release those writers and stop getting that kind of bad publicity. And this has been our experience in country after country for many, many years. You know? so, so I would say about the publicity that on the one hand it gives strength to the good guys, and on the other hand it very often discomfits the bad guys so much that they actually change their behavior. Yes. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you could give specific examples of great literary novels that are now being censored Muslim um, societies, I'm very sympathetic about satanic verses, children of Jubilawi, God dies by the Nile, and mm. so forth. But is there anything right now, and, and if so, would it be Al-Azhar that's doing it? Is it Saudi Arabia? Is it Iran? And could you give uh, the name of the book and the author? Well, the most famous book that is Baudelarized in every single Muslim country is not published unexpurgated in a single Muslim country at this point is The 1001 Nights. 
the Arabian Nights, <laughs> the, 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 the Arabian Nights, the most famous book in the history of Arab literature, cannot be published uncensored in any Arab country. Why? Because it's full of naughty bits. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of sex in the Arabian Nights, and oddly, there's very little religion. You know, God doesn't make many appearances in the Arabian Nights, but men and women having a great deal of sex mm -hmm. make a lot of appearances. And, and so there it is, only the most famous work in the history of the literature is the one being censored. Um, Iran has to authorize the publication of novels by board of censors every year. There have been years, I don't know if this is one of them, but there have been years recently when not a single novel has been approved for publication. So no novels have been published. That were, that no novels were deemed worthy of publication. So the censorship is at, a, is at a very extreme level. It's also, I think, partly an aspect of underdevelopment. It's, you should look up the Arab Development Report, which was produced under the auspices of my friend uh, Clovis Maksud, who used to be the head of the Arab League, <clears throat> and a panel of other regional intellectuals and writers on the sheer dearth of literary material, not as a result merely of censorship, but of the failure to publish or translate. Uh, Greece translates more books into out of other languages and into Greek every year than the whole Arab world does in its, in its entire language. So it's just it's a matter of the unavailability of things. That it's cultural starvation rather than a singling out of a book for censorship. The only book I know about that comes straight to my mind because I've just written the introduction to its anniversary edition is Animal Farm, which is banned in all Muslim countries. Not just because of the pigs, who after all, if you remember, don't come that well out of the book. Yes, but because certainly, certainly in Iran, where I've been involved in an attempt to get a, to get a pirate edition going, uh, possibly smuggled back into Persia, uh, it's because it's about a revolution betrayed. It's, it's, it's much more political. Okay, we're out of time, so if you could please ask a quick question, and Christopher, give a really quick answer that we can... Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, um, you mentioned Vaclav Havel earlier, who, um, as you know, was a playwright before he became uh, the president. And I've often wondered what a government composed of writers would look like, um, and if art and politics necessarily has to be independent in a free society. So I was just wondering um, if you think that would necessarily be detrimental and what that would look like. Salman for president. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mr. President, I can just... I have called him that when he was president of Japan. Uh, Plato thought it would be the worst possible idea in the Republic. He says that, that really would be terrible. That would be the, <laughs> that'd be the worst kind of tyranny you could picture. And, well, po and poetry should probably be banned. Um, when, what examples do we have that could be in the least bit encouraging here? Uh, well, Some countries have done very well by making their writers into ambassadors. Yeah. Uh, George Seferis was a brilliant ambassador. Carlos from Fuentes. Carlos Fuentes. Um, um, uh, Jorge Edwards uh, was a great diplomat. Um, Gallego, well, we had a near miss with Mario Vargas Llosa. Yes. We had Václav Havel. Um, hmm. I'm not applying for the job. Havel was the best. <laughs> and um, Georgi Conrad was offered the presidency of Hungary after the collapse of communism. But, but the author of Antipolitics and various other wonderful books, but he said no. I think he's, partly because he thought the first independent president of Hungary, I mean president of independent Hungary, should not be a Jew. Um, rather, a rather arcane reservation, but perhaps a, a, a good one um, in the circumstances. Okay, well... No, I think... I think um, I think seconds. people should be elected. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, should you know, run for really, I think on behalf of Penn, we have to offer a big vote of thanks to Christopher Hitchens. Oh, please. Thanks, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Christopher Hitchens is a contributing editor at Vanity Fair magazine and a professor of liberal studies at the New School in New York City. His books include Why Orwell Matters, God is Not Great, and the forthcoming memoir, Hitch 22. For more information, visit pen.org.
Every weekend, C-SPAN 2's book team... Very, very easy to get people to give that up or to devalue it or to panic and abandon the values of that constitution, in particular of its amendments, its wonderful amendments that constitute the Bill of Rights. And the reason why Arthur Miller was so important to us and remains important, I think, to people who don't remember any of it, is that he was one of the very few Americans who would say, no, I'm, I'm not going to go along with this, and made out of it a famous play recalling an earlier time before the founding of the Republic, before the proclamation and promulgation of the Constitution, when there was an era of witch hunting, which is another way of saying clerical or religious panic, uh, persecution, uh, tyranny, and hysteria, and to see under what conditions we who look down on the poor old primitive uneducated settlers of the Bay Colony, uh, on what conditions we're entitled to do that? What gives us the right to condescend to people if we aren't sure in our own minds that we would be able in the same conditions to resist? I think it's a fair bet that anyone who, who takes the trouble to buy a ticket to a pen event has played this game in their head at some point in their life. How would I shape up? <clears throat> what would I do when the neighbors were being sh shipped onto the trains? Or maybe when, because that so often comes when it's too late, you think maybe I should have done something before they started putting them on the trains. When should I have started? Would it have been with the censorship? Would it have been with the racism? Would it have been with the off-the-record imprisonments and executions? At what point, I, I feel sure I would have taken a stand at some point. I, I would have been brave. We all, we all have had to do this, and we've all had to look at societies contemporary to ours and in the past and ask, well, <coughs> okay, <coughs> what when the Fugitive Slave Act is still on the books and has been extended to the states of the North as well? What about it when the slave catchers cross over into Pennsylvania and come as far as New York, uh, and there's a bounty out, and there's a lot of pressure to obey the law? Of course I'm going to shelter this wanted guy in my house, aren't I? Everyone thinks that they would. Everyone has a, it's a pleasurable imagination until you begin to doubt yourself, until you begin to think, I wonder if I would be that good. There's a wonderful poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay. It's called Conscientious Objector. I can't quote it all, but it begins, it's just come back to me, but it begins, um, I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. Uh, I owe him nothing. He's mounting up in the yard today. His horse, his hooves are clattering. He has business in Cuba, but I will not give him a leg up. I will not tell him where the black boy lies in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. Well, this is a hard test for people to pass. Next, author Christopher Hitchens delivers a lecture titled Crucibles Past and Present. He and author Salman Rushdie, chair of the Penn World Voices Festival, have a conversation following the lecture. Cooper Union in New York City hosts the hour and 20 minute event. Right, hello everybody. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Salman Rushdie. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're here for the closing event of what I think has been a pretty good festival, the sixth one, and the Arthur Miller Lecture is always something we care a lot about. And as, as you'll know, we have a, a bit of bad news and a bit of good news. The uh, sad news is that Chairman Alexei couldn't make it, and you know, we're very sad. I mean, there are personal reasons, and we don't want to go into it, but basically there's a good reason why he's not here. And fortunately for us, the good news is that we were able at very, very short notice to get Christopher Hitchens to come and do the lecture instead. And <laughs> and he is over there. <laughs> um, and uh, Christopher is going to talk, um, well, his title is obviously quite relevant to Arthur Miller, Crucibles, Past and Present. Um, and the way we're going to do it is that he's going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes. Then I'm going to come up here and we're going to talk for about another 25, 30 minutes. And then, uh, you know, we'd love to throw it open to you and have you join in as well and ask questions of Christopher and like that. So without any further ado, Christopher Hitchens, author of God is Not Great and a thousand other books. Um, here he is.
Well, thank you, Salman, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming, and thank you to Penn for honoring me twice, once by giving me the Abraham Lincoln podium, which, if anything, would encourage one to abuse. I can't think of a more solid temptation than that. And the other is to be asked to speak in the name of, um, of Arthur Miller and on the, the tropes with which those of us in the writing business will always identify him. Um, I don't consider myself supremely qualified to talk, and certainly not in his name, but I can say that I knew him a little, that my wife and I were married by the same rabbi, the late Robert Goldberg, who married Arthur Miller to Marilyn Monroe. The same rabbi, in fact, who also was his character witness at the same time at the House on american Activities Committee, because it wasn't enough that Arthur was trying to get married to the woman considered the most beautiful in the world. He was at the time having to ask questions about whether or not he counted as an American at all. And I, I can't not tell you just a couple of things about him and, um, and Marilyn. Um, I just can't, so I will. Um, I can't not, so I will. Um, when she was first introduced to the Miller family, Robert Goldberg, by the way, to the end of his life, resisted all efforts to buy from him her conversion certificate to Judaism, a subject to which she was fairly new when she met the Miller family. And Mr. and Mrs. Miller Sr. used to feed her, thinking she needed a bit of you know, fattening up. And um, it often would begin with matzo ball soup. In fact, it would invariably begin that way, until the evening when she asked if they ever ate any other part of the matzo. Um, contrary to the slightly hoydenish reputation that Ms. Monroe has had ever since, has clung to her ever since, she was actually rather demure and rather modest, shy girl. And the bathroom in the Miller house was a bit too near the living room. So out of shyness, I suppose you could say, pudeur, as the French would put it, she used to, um, when she retired there, uh, turn on all the taps very loudly, um, just out of discretion, you know. Uh, you want to not depress the in-laws, and um, after she'd gone, and, Mar and Arthur turned to his mother and said, well, what did you think? His mother's opinion was very important to him. As Mrs. Miller Sr. said, well, she's a very nice girl, but she sure pisses like a racehorse. <laughs> well, okay, I, I had to do that, um, but it's not strictly to the purpose. Um, somebody told me this evening that it was possible that attendance was down uh, at today's events because of a uh, an attempted uh, atrocity in um, Times Square last night. And if that was true, <clears throat> I would both be depressed and um, I would take it as an opportunity to underline what I wanted to talk about in the case of Mr. Miller and in the topic I picked, which was Crucible's present and past, um, which is to say the contagion of fear. Um, as the United States found out in the 1950s, it's, it's, it's incredibly easy, it's depressingly easy, shall one say, to get people who are the children of a revolution, <clears throat> who are born into a country that is governed by a constitution, uh, with all the, all the rights and privileges of a free society. And by the time I'd got to know Arthur Miller, um, he was of course quite old, but he'd, he'd continued to witness throughout his life for many decades. I remember when I was at The Nation magazine publishing an extraordinary article, or helping to publish, a, a very humorous account he gave of going to a dinner at the American Embassy in Turkey at the head of a Penn delegation, which included himself and Harold Pinter, and how Harold Pinter had given the American ambassador to Turkey an absolutely ruinous time uh, throughout the dinner, all night, because of Turkey's treatment of, the, of its Kurdish minority. And I had my differences with Harold Pinter, and in fact, I'd had my differences with that same American ambassador. And I could almost feel sorry for Ambassador Strauss Hupe at having to face Miller and Pinter for an evening, knowing that American policy was complicit in a, a near genocidal policy in southeastern Anatolia. And you know, you could have let that go. You could have said, we're here on a delegation of writers. It's nice of the ambassador to have a dinner. We can sit this one out. No, you can't. No, this is your chance. You'll always be sorry later if you kept quiet. There's never a good occasion for keeping your mouth shut. So, so far nothing but praise for Arthur from me. But there came a time when a good friend of mine and a great friend of the cause of writing and of free expression and of writers and people who 
willing to sacrifice for free expression, Salman Rushdie, was hit, as you all remember, by the clerical dictator of the theocratic dictator of a foreign state with a, a fatwa, that's the way the word entered our language, that condemned him, Salman, to both a life sentence and a death sentence. It condemned him to death and it enjoined all Muslims in the world to bring it about, which meant that Salman had to alter his social life and other arrangements quite radically for, for a bit. And, well, I remember thinking on that day, which was the 14th of February, 1989, well, for me, for my lot, for us, this is the case. This is the test. We often wondered what would it be in our generation. Most free speech cases you'll find if you look into them, from the, from the trial of Socrates onwards, have been to do with blasphemy. Socrates, Galileo, Spinoza, you can fill in blanks for yourself. Almost always that someone is accused to have gone too far this time and to have outraged the sensibilities of the community as well as the laws and codes of the state and the city and profaned the gods, um, uh, which you really can't have because then where would we be? How would we know how to behave if it wasn't for a celestial dictatorship? We wouldn't know right from wrong without that. So it's a really subversive thing to be doing. I thought, well, that's pretty easy. Um, but we should do better perhaps than just get the usual suspects to sign the usual free speech petition. Uh, maybe we should all say, since the fatwa applies, explicitly applies to all those responsible for publication of the book, uh, a missing codicil that's often not mentioned, we should all sign a petition saying we consider ourselves co-responsible on the model of Spartacus or the, the Danish volunteers in the Nazi occupation who said if the Jews are made to wear a yellow star, we'll wear one too, and they can't get us all. So, I thought it was a good idea, um, just to up the ante a bit. And then Susan Sontag, who, to whom I also would like to dedicate any value to you that these remarks may possess, and to her memory, who was that year's president of Penn, fortunately, um, it came the horrible news that a lot of people were strangely reluctant to sign. That the fear factor, the feeling that the Ayatollah Khomeini's arm could reach that far, that death squads were on the prowl, that anyone who got too closely identified with this might themselves become the object of a hit, was actually keeping away some people from the meeting we planned to have to read from someone's book and keeping their names off the list. They said, no, I don't want to sign. And I, I tell this story in my upcoming memoir. I don't, I don't want to say anything at all to undermine the memory of Arthur, but there was a crisis with him. And he, he said, you know what? You probably don't need me. Um, after all, I'm Jewish. It would only attract attention. It would change the subject. Um, it's amazing how persuasive fear can be. You can always think of a good reason. I'll behave better next time. Um, maybe this isn't such a crux after all. And I remember thinking, this really is for me a moral and intellectual uh, and personal uh, crisis because if the author of The Crucible has decided that he, this is an appointment he's reluctant to keep, uh, then we're all in very grave trouble. But of course, the, the story has a happy ending and Arthur came through uh, very well, as did a number of other people who'd hesitated. But I'll, I'll never forget that week and, how, and what I learned about how fragile, how tenuous uh, the commitment of the society to its basic values often is, and how easy it is to panic people into betraying them. And I'll stay with this trope, if you don't mind, because I think it's back, and I think the rot is spreading. And I think it began this present phase about exactly five years ago, when a small newspaper in the Jutland area of Denmark, called Jylland's Post, published some, you'll know about this, some cartoons, better to say caricatures, actually, of the figure of the Prophet Muhammad, who it's wrongly thought cannot ever be represented in art. There are several Islamic representations of him, particularly in Persian culture, oddly enough.